Were you or your family part of the transport? Yes, we were. How were you selected for the transport? We were notified and had to report to a certain place. Could you describe the conditions? Well, we were shipped in cattle cars and didn't know where we were going, hoping it would be better than where we came from. But what hap Where were you sent then? To, to Auschwitz. What happened when you arrived at the camp? We were separate. I was separated from my parents, not realizing what the separation meant. All right. Did you arrive with members of your family, your parents? Yes, with my parents. What happened to them? I never saw them again. Were you aware of a selection process when you arrived? We not for this, there was a selection process. I didn't know the reason could for you, the selection. Could you describe how the process worked? The 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 the, the, the very young, the young and able were sent to one side and people that were older or not quite as strong or, or the very, very young that could not be productive were selected to go the other way. What do you remember about your first days in the camp? I've tried very, very hard to forget, but I remember that the, the most vivid memory is getting up and going to whatever they call bathrooms and seeing the smoke and flames come out of the crematorium. What were your thoughts and reactions? Sad. How long Frightened. Was could you describe the camp and the daily routine? The, the, the thing that stands out vividly in my mind was standing what they called a pal when they counted us and early, early in the morning for hours and hours and hours and as, as counting us to make sure no one had escaped. Also, the, the, the place was terribly, terribly muddy and they handed us wooden shoes and one step and the shoe would sink into the mud and pull it out and walking with the other, cold, no food no sanitation, and fear. Were there any attempts at resistance or escape? Not that I recall. Did you think you would survive? Always. I, always, I had, somehow, I'm, I was young and stupid. I never doubted that I wouldn't survive. Why do you think you survived? First of all, I was very optimistic about life when I was young, and, and at that point healthy, and 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 maybe just not realizing the, the chances that I might not. Was there any special or unusual experience that you would like to tell me about? I have tried very, very, very difficult to forget and how to talk about it. Okay. Hiding. Did you hide it all, Mom? No. Okay, we'll skip this one section. False papers, did you have any? No. Resistance, were you in a resistance? No. Okay, is there anything else you want to say, anything about your sister, what happened with your sister? Yeah, I can tell them. Should I go on? Yeah, tell, because that, that doesn't end, yeah. you know, what happened to you and your family. My sister had to work in a, in a, in a factory that produced uh, things for the war for Germany, and she was fluent in French, and the people that worked in that particular fac factory were French prisoners of war and Jews, and many times they would use her as an interpreter, and one time, going from getting a tool or a part, going from one place to another, she uh, came, she met a French prisoner and he asked her how she was and she said fine. And one of the guards uh, had heard it and asked her what she said and she repeated nothing. He just asked her how she was and she answered and was fine. He says, well, he says, I don't understand that language, I don't have to believe you. And a few days later, she didn't come home and we never saw her again. Good evening. Um, my name is Larry Bacow, and I have the privilege of being president of Harvard. And I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to this very, very special event. We're here this evening to speak and to learn about hate. What helps it spread? What helps it stick? What helps it thrive? Listing the reasons why this work is critical would consume the entire hour that we have together. In this year alone, we've experienced and witnessed hateful acts that shocked the conscience and stirred the soul. It increasingly feels as if many streams are converging, and I believe we're approaching a watershed in this country. The stakes for individuals, for communities, and dare I say, for democracy itself, could not be higher. How can I higher education devoted as we are to truth, expose and combat untruth? How can we help to challenge unshakable 
certainty founded in many cases on the shakiest of foundations, or in some cases, literally on no foundations at all. How can we resurface and reconsider the past in pursuit of a better future? Answering these questions and other questions and, and sharing what we've learned and devising new ways forward is absolutely essential. Fortunately, the Shorenstein Center is doing tremendous work towards these ends through a variety of initiatives, including the Task Project, Media Manipulation Casebook, and the Harvard Kennedy Center uh, School Misinformation Review. And this evening, we celebrate the addition of yet another extraordinary resource, the testimonies of more than 56,000 survivors and witnesses of genocide. Um, many of you have heard me refer to my mother, who you may have just heard in the recording that just played, um, late Ruth Bacow. Uh, my mother survived Auschwitz as a teenager, the only member of her family, um, and literally the only Jew from her town who survived the war. Uh, she came to this country on the second liberty ship that brought refugees from Europe after World War II. Uh, her story is now part of the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, um, as are my story and that of my sister as well. Knowing that my mother's voice will carry into the future means more to me than I can say. Um, I have to say I am extraordinarily grateful to my good, good friend, Cece Chan, for encouraging our participation and making this gathering and Harvard's access to the full archive possible. The Harvard Kennedy School and the Shorenstein Center are tremendously fortunate to count Cece among our most devoted supporters and to benefit from her experience, her wisdom, um, and her extraordinary commitment to repairing the world. I never cease to admire Cece's passion and all the good work that she does, this important and necessary work uh, that, is, uh, that it has enabled. Um, Cece, from all of us, thank you so very much. Now it's, it's my pleasure um, to introduce a, a longtime uh, friend and colleague and fellow two-time president. Uh, Carol Fult and I met years ago uh, when I was at Tufts and, and Carol was at, at Dartmouth. And our careers have intersected um, on and off um, ever since. Uh, she's now the distinguished president of the University of Southern California, um, having joined USC in July of 2019 after a very, very successful run um, as head of the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, Carol, I suspect these last two years um, of your presidency at USC have probably seemed like at least 20 years to you. Um, uh, and I'm sure that like me, you've also been looking forward to this event for, for quite a long time. Uh, it's, it's really my pleasure and honor, Carol, to welcome you to Harvard, at least virtually. Um, and once again, thank you for your leadership, um, which not only is uh, good for USA, but for all of higher education. Um, now, Carol, I, I turn the floor at least virtually over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Backout, Larry, for your wonderful remarks, but also for the way you introduced the importance of this wonderful archive. It is really fabulous to be able to work together with you on this, and I think it's going to really help uh, secure a partnership in many, many ways as we move forward, and I'm, I'm really just so happy about that. When I visited uh, you about a year, a little over a year ago, you told me a bit of your own story. And I was so moved when I learned that you and your sister Lainey are the first second generation survivors in the USC Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive. And we just heard that wonderful testimony and, which, and that archive of course is home to your mother's testimony. 
you know, I think I said then, but I consider the USC Shoah Foundation's visual archive to be a global treasure. I think it's a gift to the world. It's meant to be saved. It's meant to be cherished and it's meant to be shared. And it is really one of the greatest privileges that a university could have to be home to this powerful archive and to the courageous testimonies that are in the archive. Oops. What you're not supposed to do is keep on your phone when you're talking on <laughs> this. I'm sorry about that. Um, it is, you know, it is a huge, it is really a pri privilege for us to be that home. And I think it's a very great honor to join with you and everyone at the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School as partners in this most meaningful work. When I became president here, one of the very first places I visited was the Shoah Foundation. I had, of course, heard so much about it over the years, but I have to say nothing actually could have prepared me for the emotion that I felt when I first visited there and heard some of the amazing moving testimonies from the Holocaust survivors. The staff were amazing and they even helped me locate uh, some people from my own Albanian heritage. Since that time, I've had the amazing fortune to meet a number of survivors, their families, and other witnesses to genocide. And every single time, I'm moved by their experiences, their willingness, and, and their passion to have their stories shared. Every time, we can feel the sharp sense of loss, but they also bring forth a radiance of hope. Their stories and their testimonies are more important now than ever. And I think we have to save and memorialize them so they can be a resource and a guide for future generations. As Larry said, we're all working to eradicate hate wherever it still exists in society. They help us remember what's at stake. And they remind us of the importance of fighting bias and anti-Semitism, xenophobia and racism in all its forms. This archive has a profound impact on everyone who sees it. And I wanted to say that I have spoken to so many students at USC, students who work right at the Shoah Foundation or that visit there. And every single one of them has told me that that visit changed their lives. So I know that the Harvard students are gonna feel that too. So it was just a year ago, right before the pandemic hit, that Larry and I meeting on the Harvard campus to plan this wonderful event scheduled for April. Of course, our plans shifted, but the wonderful teams that have been working did not, it did not affect their determination. And here we are with this extraordinary panel who are going to speak and a chance to mark this partnership at a very meaningful moment in history. Harvard became a visual archive access site, as President Bacow mentioned, through the hard work, the generosity, and the fierce determination of Cece Chan. And I want to express my own gratitude to Cece. She continues to make a difference as a member, of course, at, at the Harvard Kennedy School's Leadership Circle, but also at the USC Shoah Foundation Executive Committee. I always love being with Cece because she inspires everyone to do more. I'm also really glad that Harvard and USC, living on two sides that embrace our nation, as well as looking to the east and to the west across the globe, are able to share this significant connection and carry for the grand purpose of this 56,000 people who have given testimony. And they will be part of research, teaching, learning the things universities do, developing empathy, understanding, and respect and being a source of great conversations. And as we look forward, conversations we're already having about identifying and countering hate across both of our campuses and beyond will continue. At USC, like at Harvard, we're working with all of our communities who are coming together to support and amplify a collective struggle against hate. We're being inspired by the testimonies of the archive and the Stronger Than Hate at USC program that's creating wonderful programs and workshops to foster a campus culture of compassion. Our aim is for hate to have no harbor. 
So tonight's event is a wonderful chance for all of us to hear from experts, learn together. And I, again, want to thank our panelists and thanks for having a chance to uh, be part of this amazing event as we work together to be stronger than hate. So now it is also my privilege to share a special message from the founder of the USC Shoah Foundation, who, Steven Spielberg, who 25 years ago had the vision that the survivors' firsthand accounts could be used to fight hatred and bigotry. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming together today. Uh, and a special thank you to President Folt and President Bacow for bringing all of us to this moment of sharing and to these moments of collaboration. And now the heartbeat of Shoah Foundation is the incredible bravery of the survivor community with survivors like Ruth Bacow and their families who contribute to the archive by giving testimony. But it's the sharing of these stories with the world that allows our work to have the lasting impact that I always dreamed it could generation after generation. Because when institutions like Harvard raise their hand to aid in that sharing, I cannot tell you how much that means to show a foundation and to me personally. And I know that the entire Harvard community is going to benefit from this incredible archive and to have a partner in President Bacow and Harvard who now stand with us in our stronger than hate efforts just leaves me truly honored and excited for what we can do together in all the days ahead. So once again, everyone, thank you. Thank you, uh, President Bacow, President Folt, uh, Mr. Spielberg, and uh, I am so grateful to be here with this virtuoso quartet for such an urgent topic. I'm Nancy Gibbs. I'm the director of the Shorenstein Center. And tonight we're going to explore these topics um, with Marty Barron, who until two months ago was the executive editor of the Washington Post. Before that, the Boston Globe. Welcome home. Uh, Cornell William Brooks, who's a professor of practice of public leadership and social justice here at the Kennedy School, as well as being a lawyer and ordained minister and the former president and CEO of the NAACP. Joan Donovan, the research director of the Schoenstein Center and a scholar of disinformation and networked hate groups. And Stephen Smith, the Finchie Viterbi executive director of USC Shoah Foundation and UNESCO chair of genocide. Uh, education. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Stephen, if I could start with you, uh, if the Schoenstein Center had existed in 1936, we would have studied Nazi propaganda, how it, ideology spread. The archive uh, is both a witness to the Holocaust as a historical event, but it's also a living record of trauma and of ongoing genocidal efforts. I wonder if you could help our students and, and uh, audience understand how to approach it, how to explore it. How does something that looking back in time help us move forward? Well, I think that's a really good question, uh, Nancy, because we tend to look at events like those that, that include mass atrocity and genocide <laughs> retrospectively. We look back on them and we document testimony after. Let's just take your point. Let's go back to 1936 and just say, so let's just say we had our iPhone in 1936. What would we have done with it in order to be able to highlight what was happening in Nazi Germany? How would we have used it to capture the voices of people in 1936 who by 1942 had been shot into graves or gone up in the, in the gas chambers? Would we have used those tools wisely and in a timely way? So I think to answer your question, I think what the lesson of history is here, we can't wait for disaster to happen and for mass violence and genocide to occur when we have the tools at our disposal and we should listen deeply to the 56,000 people from 10 different genocides in the last century um, to what those warning signs might be. Um, Cornell, again, linking past and present, you cite uh, the Yale Law School scholar, James Q. Whitman, who, makes the case in Hitler's American model that right. the Third Reich found inspiration 
in America's legal system of apartheid. How would you say we teach uh, about the relationship between American anti-Black racism and Germany's anti-Semitism then, as well as anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism in America now? Sure. So first of all, uh, just thank you um, so much for this occasion to speak to our past, speak to our present, uh, and the future in this moment. So just extraordinarily uh, grateful. Here's what I would know. So the Nazis were not only inspired, as you know, by the Jim Crow regime, American apartheid, but they felt that America's mis mis anti misogynism uh, laws were too, too stringent. And so the point being here is evil is influenced by evil. Legal regimes uh, that perpetuate uh, hate are influenced by one another. And so when we look at German anti-Semitism, American anti-Black racism, there's a connection. When we think about the fact that there are only two organizations that are 100 years old in this country that were born out of hate crimes, specifically lynching, the uh, Anti-Defamation League as a consequence of the lynching of Leo Frank, the NAACP as a consequence of the lynchings in the hometown of Lincoln, Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, Springfield, Illinois. What that says to us is that we have yoked histories, yoked tragedy. And what that means is that we have to be vigilant in our teaching in the present moment. And so in other words, those 56,000 voices not only represent an archive of the past, they represent a repository in the present. So when we have a generation that know we're a significant and an unconscionable fraction that know little about the Holocaust, uh, can't name a death camp, are uncertain of how many people perished uh, in the Holocaust. What that says to us is it places upon Harvard uh, a responsibility, a moral responsibility to teach. It places upon our advocates a responsibility to teach the past in order to inform the present and guard against hate in the future. And lastly, it, it, it places before all of us uh, the necessity of developing new ways, new strategies, new technologies uh, to combat hate. So in other words, this requires ongoing vigilance uh, and ongoing creativity and moral imagination in terms of ensuring that the past does not replicate itself in the present and the future. So Marty, I think of journalists as being teachers as well as providing some of the vigilance that, that Cornell mentions. This archive, is an incredible collection of fact in every form, 56,000 testimonies of survivors and witnesses telling their stories. Uh, the cumulative power of that information is overwhelming. And yet, you know, even as we speak, there is a fourth recount of votes going on in Maricopa County, Arizona, because despite three former counts in countless court cases and, and evidence to the contrary, there are still many, many people who still believe uh, that Donald Trump uh, won that state. And so I'm, I'm, I'd love for you to help us understand what newsrooms do, what journalists do when facts and eyewitnesses and testimony lose their power to define what is true. Well, thanks for the tough question, Nancy. Um, uh, look, I mean, I do think we're in a time where uh, people cannot agree on what happened yesterday, uh, even if there's a mountain of evidence uh, that that the the notion of objective fact of objective truth has been severely undermined, uh, and that people are drawn to only those things that reinforce their pre-existing point of view, and that people do not necessarily many people do not necessarily want to be informed, they want to be affirmed in their own views. Uh, so you know what can we do? Um, um, I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer to that. I mean, certainly we can provide as much as possible and with the internet helps us this way is that we can provide as much documentary evidence as possible. So if you wanna take a look at what happened on January 6th, uh, there's now a mountain of documentary evidence, uh, video evidence, audio evidence uh, uh, of all types, digital evidence uh, that has been uh, collected by media organizations and by law enforcement agencies. And uh, our obligation is to lay that all out so that people can uh, see what the actual evidence is. That said, 
there's still huge segments of the population that continue to deny that. Even with the Holocaust, uh, despite the mountain of evidence, uh, which you're talking about here today, uh, there are still people who deny what actually occurred. Uh, and so, you know, how do we get through? Uh, I don't know that I have a, a real answer for that. Uh, I think, and I'm not sure we can get through to everybody. I think we have to work at the margins in a way. We have to make sure that a majority of the people, a substantial majority of the people understand what the facts are and, that, and make sure that, those, that, that they prevail, that they are the ones who prevail in terms of setting policy and, um, uh, and having an impact. Uh, and, and I think we can work at that. I think if we try to say, well, everybody should agree uh, that these are the facts, we are not likely to get there. Uh, so we need to work on the people who are open to listening to the facts, find out who they are, and present them in a way uh, that is as convincing uh, as, as it possibly can be. And um, that's where I think we ought to be concentrating our efforts. Um, we're not going to get everybody. Well, speaking of, of setting policy, which is a very um, live opportunity right now, Joan, a few hours ago, you were testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee on disinformation and algorithms and amplification. And mm -hmm. I'd love to hear um, how you would assess the learning curve among lawmakers promising to address this challenge that we're talking about. Um, yeah, well, I just wanna say I'm um, honored and blessed to be able to be in conversation with everybody here this evening. and. Uh, and I do want to give a plug uh, to Cornell William Brooks's uh, syllabus and and uh, people versus the Klan uh, as something that is very recent and um, uh, something I'm going to use in my teaching. Um, but I didn't know if he was going to come out and say it, so I wanted to make sure I got it on the table. Um, that being said, I think yeah, like the learning curve is high because history is hard to remember if people are really trying to do their their worst to disrupt flows of information. Um, and, you know, one of the things that struck me today as I was talking with members of um, the Senate, as well as uh, representatives from these companies, is they do not know what they have built. They don't even have the metaphors to express how the technology works. Uh, they were oscillating between saying it was an attention economy to this is an addiction thing. And until we, you know, metaphors are really powerful narrative tool that can help us get to solutions, especially if we shape narratives. But as I was thinking and, and listening and trying to decipher really what people did and didn't understand about this technology, it occurred to me that if Facebook had done more to model the networks of anti-Semites, uh, especially in 2016, 2017, just like we used to do with our research um, when we would look at hashtags that most of this stuff has been cleaned up now, but there was a, a anti-Holocaust um, documentary circulating called The Greatest Story Never Told. And it was a meme and people would drop into chats and say, hey, check out The Greatest Story Never Told. They'd hold watch parties for it on YouTube. Um, and one of the things that I learned from watching these communities is they learned they learn how to evade these systems. They learn how to stay uh, present and, and they learn how to speak in code. And these are all things that if you took a historical uh, lens and look back in time, that it's, it's all resonant with things that we've learned about um, both anti-Black racism and, and anti-Semitic organizing. And so uh, the challenge of policy is a real one. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I don't think I have all the answers, but I've got a few things we, we could try. Um, but the main thing here about the testimonies in the archive that uh, we're celebrating tonight is that that's not lost now to history. Uh, it's now a challenge, though. Of course, 55,000 testimonies is big data. Um, it's now a challenge for us as academics to help piece those pu that puzzle together and, and represent it in a way that, that people can uh, both honor and understand. 
Stephen, uh, Facebook admitted um, that its network was responsible for the spread of misinformation and hate speech that fueled the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar. And um, you've, the, the USC Shoah stretches far beyond in its reach, beyond uh, Holocaust testimony. Can you talk a little bit about um, the work that you've done with <coughs> Myanmar? Yeah, I, I was in um, Bangladesh as the Rohingya were coming out of Myanmar into the uh, huge refugee camp at Nancy in Kutupalang, it's in southern Bangladesh. And um, what was surprising was that the Rohingya had a word in English. It was social media. They knew the word in English and they used it all the time. They also had devices, uh, mainly Android devices. Mm. But guess what? they don't ha didn't have access to accounts because they didn't have the, the rights to have a phone account. So what they knew was that social media was being used against them, weaponized against them, even though they themselves did not have access to it. And they used the phones that they had bought on the markets and so forth to take photographs. And so I was sitting in this tent, tarpaulin tent, with people who had phones with no accounts who had photographs of atrocities that they believe were coordinated using social media. <clears throat> it was a shocking revelation. And we were able to use those phones um, and the data on those phones to be able to ident identify when um, they had taken the photographs, not where, because it wasn't connected to the internet, but they, were, they had their the clocks. So we could actually identify where the photographs were taken, sorry, when, when the photographs were taken, if not where. Um, and we were able to then um, triangulate those um, incidents to the social media itself. So to your point, um, it, there is no excuse for you know, uh, organizations to simply say, well, we didn't know. You have to know if you're creating a commercial company and you are utilizing, instrumentalizing these algorithms for the use of the public good, one would assume, um, you have to know enough about what, how that can be used and utilized, particularly against vulnerable populations. So in my previous answer, I said, how might we use our devices to help to prevent such events happening? The question is, how do we make sure that devices aren't being used and these platforms aren't being used as weapons against civilians? And unfortunately, we're seeing that is the case. And it extends beyond that as well to the issue of denial. You know, Facebook uh, has pulled back on its position on Holocaust denial. But I was in on the conversation and the correspondence between Facebook and the, the community of people that represent Holocaust museums. And the intransigence that was shown on that issue was not just a matter of, oh, it's policy. It was very clearly that it was, com it was commercially inconvenient to address the issue of Holocaust denial and that it would open a can of worms that they did not want to address. And so therefore the position was to hold on the issue of denial. Now Facebook is very active on not only um, uh, preventing denial, but also active in promoting Holocaust awareness. So the question might also be, how come that took three years to come to that conclusion, to become active in the promotion of better connection to reliable sources like the Shoah Foundation or the US Holocaust Museum or our universities, which is now happening? Well, so that also makes me want to flip the the lens and look at the power of these platforms to connect and to mobilize people. Because of course, if it were, you know, if it were as simple as just saying they've become a net negative for society and so they all need to be um, massively regulated and broken up. But Cornell, um, in this incredible year of category five news cycles, uh, the response to George Floyd's killing uh, first in the streets and then finally in the courts has been framed as a defining moment and a turning point. Tonight is all about context and perspective and connection. Can you help us put that case and verdict in, in context? Sure. So <clears throat> one thing I, I would note is just how uh, timely and, and tragically topical this conversation is. So if we look at the George, uh, I should say the Derek Chauvin Verdict, George Floyd murder, 27 million Americans take to the streets, largely fueled by social media. And uh, taking to the streets in terms of marches and demonstrations 
uh, for black lives where the majority of the people in the protests and demonstrations were not African-American in many jurisdictions. This moment, of course, is tied to the, the George Floyd video is tied to the uh, photograph of Emma Till in 1955. Both the video and the photograph had the, the effect of animating civil rights movements. In other words, the Emmett Till photograph literally inspired the, the Montgomery boycott, inspired the resilience in that moment, in the same way the George Floyd inspires uh, in this moment. These, these moments are connected in terms of racialized violence, and they represent tragic opportunities for us to use technology, meaning, the Montgomery boycott was fueled by uh, women using a piece of pre-Twitter technology called the mimeograph machine. In this moment, right, we have young people with their phones who are using, literally using the technology to amplify the message. Our challenge is literally targeting the message, focusing the message, creating opportunities for occasion and tying present social justice challenges to the social justice challenges of the past. In other words, when we have young people, activists, students at Harvard concerned about police brutality, they need to understand how is this connected to Emmett Till? How is this connected to lynching? How is this connected to Leo Frank? How is this connected to the, to the Holocaust? That implies uh, a, a necessity of us teaching on new platforms. So as my colleague mentioned, uh, when CNN uh, did a docu-series on the lynching of Michael Donald in 1981. Um, we saw that as an occasion to not only tell that story, but to embed some of the lessons in a syllabus, to encourage our students to, to read and to study, but also to teach advocacy in this moment. Because I agree with, with Marty, it's not enough to provide, surround students and activists with objective facts. As my colleague Marshall Gantz uh, talks about, we've got to engage in, in storytelling and narrative uh, change. And as I like to argue, we have to have a, hermen a hermeneutic of resistance. We have to interpret our history in ways that en encourage a sense of resiliency and agency and a sense of an ability to take on hate and win. And, and that, that uh, has everything to do with the kind of leadership we try to teach at the Kennedy School, right? This doesn't happen by accident. Um, so right now, we could turn on uh, a cable network and listen to a host talk in prime time about the great replacement theory, like not some fringe message in a dark corner of discord, but actually on prime time. Joan, is it an overstatement to say that part of the challenge that we're all dealing with is that white supremacy has been normalized? That the distant, um, between the distant margins and the mainstream, where would you place acceptance of this movement at this point? It, unfortunately, normalized is not the right word because I think a lot of us are still horrified. I think it's actually still a relatively small percentage of people that are willing to espouse these theories in public. But nevertheless, what it does by putting it out there and exposing millions of people to these ideas is it it creates that moment of anxiety and hostility that uh, further polarizes and pushes people apart. When it comes to the great replacement theory, I mean, the first time I heard it was, um, well, at a punk club when I was a teenager learning about, you know, what it means to avoid the big guys with shaved heads, right? I mean, it, this theory, the great replacement theory goes on longer than that, of course, but for decades, it's it's known as a radicalizing theory. It's not just a, a radical theory, but it's one that makes people believe that there are other people out there that are consciously trying to um, trying to take over the world in some way. And of course, that has resonance with many anti-Semitic tropes. But one thing that's that's for sure about this moment, as people start talking about great the Great Replacement theory, is that um, we have to situate it contextually, and then we have to look at the culture work that it does, uh, especially as, uh, you know, more and more young white men are exposed to it, talk about it, become comfortable with it. One of the sickest things that I saw years ago um, 
as I watched white supremacists get organized behind some of the vitriol uh, about uh, of of Trump related to build the wall, which is a meme from uh, the the Minutemen and in, 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 in militias uh, at our at, at the southern border. And the the problem with with that uh, great replacement theory is, as more people learn it, it becomes harder and harder to defend against it because. Ultimately, uh, you do then have to reckon with it in a different type of way. But over time, if it becomes a worldview, right, if it becomes something that a lot of people are comfortable with, uh, that they understand it, that it becomes shorthand for a thing, then what we're going to come up against is even more dangerous because there are very few things that people are willing to lay their life down for. One of them is democracy, and one of them is the fate of their you know, national uh, identity. And so we have to be really careful about that in public. And one other point I'll just make is that I think, you know, people who pretend to be center left, center right uh, during the pandemic um, really, you know, are starting to show who and what they are, especially folks that are far right that have been pretending to be somewhere in the center they just haven't been exposed to a lot of new and different and, uh, and ideas offline, frankly. And what we're seeing now with, with, expre uh, with expressly uh, the Tucker Carlson piece of this is um, not only really scary to me, but also something that I'm starting to see reflected in uh, the very dark spaces of white supremacist organizing where they are literally getting a kick out of it, making Joker memes of Tucker Carlson, and uh, they're very much excited about what's to come uh, this summer. So Joan was a, a pioneer of the idea of strategic silence. And Marty, this is one that I think journalists would have struggled with because our reflex leans towards publishing, revealing, uncovering, and the idea that there are some things that should should not be shared, not be published, not be written about, um, doesn't sit easily with us. And so I'm, I'm wondering about how you have come to think about that balance in, in an age of widespread disinformation that's having immense impact on our politics. How do you cover it, explore it, explain it without contributing and amplifying? Well, it's really hard. I mean, because if you're gonna cover it, you're clearly amplifying it. Um, and if you don't cover it, then you're accused of ignoring it. Uh, so you're in a bind um, and we're in a bind when we, uh, just as journalists, um, and we, you get criticized for that. We certainly got criticized during the Trump administration, uh, you know, on the very coverage of the very same subject. If, you, if we covered what he was saying and people said we were amplifying what he was saying or his lies or his, his rhetoric. And if we didn't cover it, people said, how is it that you're ignoring his lies and his rhetoric? Shouldn't you be telling the public how outrageous this is? You're keeping it from them. So um, it is a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. I mean, I think that you know, our obligation obviously is to um, call out lies, uh, is to point out what, what's, uh, what's been fabricated, it's to point out uh, uh, things that are beyond misleading, that are deliberately false. Um, and, and yet, uh, even in doing that, uh, people will accuse us of having spread the false information in the first place. And yet, I do believe that, you know, the people who are susceptible to that kind of false information are, um, uh, if we were to ignore it, they would still receive that information. They would receive it through other means. Uh, the Internet allows them to. Uh, people are drawn to their own sort of uh, channels of so-called information, which often is misinformation. Um, and that's where they're getting their information from in the first place. They're not looking necessarily to the Washington Post uh, to tell them what's true and false. In fact, they tend to dismiss us as a source of uh, truth and false, falsehood. And so I do think it's our obligation to tell people what's going on in society as a whole, uh, to uh, try to penetrate that with, um, with true information, to document it as, as thoroughly and as rigorously uh, as we possibly can and hope, frankly, and it is a hope that there are people at the margins who will be receptive to what we have to, what we have to say and what we have to show. Um, uh, so I think that's our only, that's our only option. Um, obviously it has to be information or it has to be something that is having a 
a significant impact on the public discourse and on public policy. If it's really just at the fringes and it's not really all that consequential, I don't think we need to pay attention to it. But if it's beginning to get into the mainstream and it's affecting uh, what's happening in Washington, what's happening in the Congress, um, the political landscape in a, in a meaningful way, I think it's our obligation to tell people about it and tell people what the truth is. I want to open this conversation um, to our audience, uh, especially to our students. Uh, our first question comes from Ryan, who is a student at the college. Ryan. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, and, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming to speak to us this evening. It's been a really interesting conversation so far. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the Biden administration formally recognized uh, the Armenian genocide for the first time, which is something that has been talked about for a long time uh, in the United States and across the world, but hasn't really uh, come to fruition until now. Uh, and I think it kind of marks a, a, a notable change, uh, but it also kind of underscores this idea that I think, um, I mean, Mr. Brooks, you talked about uh, how social media has is, is increased advocacy, uh, but we still see a lot of complacency when it comes to hate across the world. How can we bridge those gaps and bring more and more people into the circle, especially from an international perspective, uh, to combat hate, to combat genocide, uh, and to combat all these, these things that bring us apart together, uh, bring us apart as humans, uh, like the Holocaust and, and these tragedies of the past. Hmm. I can d defer to, uh, to Stephen and I'll, I'll follow you. Follow you. Okay, great. Just a, a quick one on the on the actual issue of genocide, um, Ryan. And thanks for asking that question. So, President Biden has done the right thing. A um, hundred years late, uh, one hundred and six years too late, I would say. Um, it's good that he's done it, but of course, the damage that's been done through denial is irreparable for many generations. The survivors of the genocide of the Armenia went to their deaths, um, believing that, the, that, that their experience had been denied by, but particularly for those that made this their country. Um, they live with their nightmares and their trauma to the end of their days. Denial is the third act of genocide, and it's just as important to address the denial because the denial contains implicitly the ideology of ge the genocide that was created in the first instance, because uh, denialists always, almost exclusively, um, align themselves with the original ideology. So we have to take it extremely seriously. But you're asking a great question about what we do about that, and I'll pass that over to you, Professor Brooks. <laughs> well, I will simply posit a theory, which is that when I look at these archives and the fact that you have on the same narrative and same moral plane, stories of genocide uh, in different countries, focus, and if we think about the questions that were posed to Larry's uh, mother about suffering, about resilience, the questions and where the stories are placed provide opportunities, avenues, doorways for empathy. And so from the vantage point of a, a professor who teaches advocacy, I think it's critically important that we tell stories in ways that give people an opportunity to access empathy. So in other words, hearing stories that, that not only remind you of someone else's tragedy, but also remind you of the vulnerability of your own vulnerability to tragedy, insights into your own history. And so when we think, if I can just give a personal, personal example, I remember going off to graduate school and having a friend of mine recommend that I take a class with a professor, Ellie Wiesel, whom I had never heard of. I grew up in, in, in a small town in South Carolina. Taking that one class opened doorways of understanding, not merely in, I'm saying, not only in terms of the Holocaust, but also in terms of my own understanding of the slave narratives, my own understanding of tragedy. The point being here is to the extent that we have access to these archives, we then become emissaries and ambassadors for other communities, right? And that's at least one way of creating the empathy that creates the agency, that creates the resilience that allows us to mount social justice movements against hate. That's the theory. That's a great connection, thank you. For that. Um, and thank you, Ryan. Our next question uh, is from Dwight, who is a student at the Kennedy School. Thanks. 
Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Dwight Nell, a second year graduate student in the Master in Public Policy program at the Kennedy School. Thank you guys all for being here. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. So this question is not directed to anyone in particular, um, but rather to the whole panel. So during the Trump presidency, we witnessed an incredibly disturbing rise of outright white supremacist ideologies into the mainstream discourse. Now, as you all referenced earlier, many of these malicious actors use social media networks like Facebook and Twitter uh, to promote their views and organize gatherings. But at the same time, these platforms are used by incredible activists like those within the Black Lives Matters movement to promote justice. And I, I wanna know, how do you grapple with this dichotomy and what advice would you give to Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey if he were here right now? Thank you. Joan, you wanna take that? Yeah, I, so man, tough question. I've been studying the internet for a decade now and I began studying the internet during um, the rise of, of the Egyptian revolution and then the Occupy movement. Um, and what I've seen over the last you know, decade is that uh, many pro-social movements had a first mover advantage because usually uh, movement people will try anything. The telephone comes out, you invent phone trees. <laughs> the fax comes out, you know, AIDS activists, they come out and they do black facts or, or they do, uh, you know, all kinds of different ways in which technology get rapidly incorporated into movements because movements are about messaging. They're about reaching people. Um, but there's two things that happened along the way, which is political campaigns saw how effective that style of messaging was and jumped in. And platform companies realized they could monetize that through advertising and kind of force uh, messaging into public conversation. And then down the road, uh, you know, kind of like playing basketball, you practice and, and then others get good at the game as well. And so that's when you see foreign operatives start to, the first thing Russia does is it pretends to be U.S. social movements. Why? Because U.S. social movements drive tons of en engagement. And uh, essentially, it's a, it's, it's a free way to, sp to spread messages far and wide. But when it comes to the platforms, they haven't caught up with the innovation. They haven't caught up with all of the different actors usually using the exact same products. Uh, there's, not, uh, there's not a lot of hacking involved. Uh, it's usually just ordinary uses of advertising technology that leads to this um, massive scaling of misinformation. But to get to the point, if I was to give um, advice, I'd say uh, act quickly. When you see these groups starting to coordinate around hate, disinformation, incitement, and violence, move, get moving and do something to to disaggregate those networks um and i think facebook finally is getting the message and and thanks to the reporting at buzzfeed the, last week um they've really started to understand that ad, uh, coordinated inauthentic behavior only matters when a movement is just getting started but authenticity comes later and adversarial movements are really uh, able to use this technology for, um, you know, I, I, I said this at, at the Senate hearing, but to democracy's end. I mean, they're not here for any of the pro-social reasons that we would, we would want uh, someone to be using this technology for in the first place. But it's a tough question, but I think ultimately these companies, this is just a smash and grab on journalism and capitalism. Dor Dorsey and Zuckerberg are headed to social banking. And if you don't watch out for that, bankers, <laughs> they're going to have to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, John. Our next question is from uh, Alex. Thank you all so much. I'm a Kennedy School grad from 2013. Uh, this is basically the glass half full, glass half empty question. So. Uh, thinking about the uh, the conflict that we are viewing uh, from the uh, the the weaponization of white supremacist rhetoric that you mentioned by uh, personalities like Tucker Carlson to uh, the the basic weaponization of misinformation for um, essentially political gain for for electoral uh, strategy. Do you regard this as what someone a couple of decades ago might have called the death throes of insurgency? Or is this something that is 
going to be with us for a while and is in danger of success. Should we be optimistic? Who wants to take that? Just say no, don't be optimistic, take action. What action? I think one of the things we could do very easily is in, insist on public interest obligations for timelines and news feeds that ups timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. That doesn't even get into any of the suppression of content stuff, but we do have to balance, uh, in some respects, people's access to the truth, and we actually have to carve a path for them to be able to access it, especially if you're Googling something like mail-in ballots or coronavirus origin you shouldn't find disinformation and be led into rabbit holes. You should be able to access um, the, the most uh, accurate and up-to-date information available. Uh, but these companies automate many of these processes uh, that would be better served by uh, employing, let's say, 10,000 librarians. Because we're running out of time, I wanna, uh, but I also wanna leave people with something to, to take home and act on or hope for. So this is a lightning round, but I wonder if each of the four of you could give us um, one idea or trend or technology uh, that gives you hope that you think shows sign of, of progress movement in the right direction that um, people should learn more about and list in, think about, uh, take, take heart from. Uh, Stephen, I, you know, I, if, if while the others have time to think, I'm interested in the fact that you you're developing a blockchain technology that might help us fight deep fakes. Yeah. So uh, actually, Nancy, we have a brand new podcast at the Show Foundation called The Memory Generation. You can find mm -hmm. it on any podcast uh, place. Uh, our next edition on May the 15th will be about blockchain and how we can use that to preserve history, but also to ensure that we keep the evidence secure. The project we have is called Starling and what it does, it encrypts um, data at the point of which it's captured onto the blockchain. And actually we were teamed up with Reuters and Reuters on April the 6th, or January the 6th were at the Capitol building with the cameras that were equipped with the Starling framework. What it means is that data which was entered onto blockchain on January the 6th will not be able to be altered. On that podcast, we will have um, Ben Ferenc, Harvard alum, 101 years old, who was a Nuremberg prosecutor. And he will be talking about the importance of evidence in 1947 and reflect on what it means to have these new technologies today. And he did that interview from his home on his own with a computer um, it, from Florida. So do tune into that because uh, your Harvard alum, Ben Ferris, is going to take us on a journey about evidence. Fantastic. Um, Marty, something that... Uh, well, it's not a technology. I mean, I do. I, I am encouraged by seeing a greater attention to the idea of uh, new to media literacy education uh, at a, in middle school and high school, even in college. I think it's critically important that uh, uh, that people be taught how to be critical consumers of information. Thank you. Um, that's very important work, uh, Joan. Yeah, I'm so I yeah, technological utopia is what got us into this mess, right? I think part of the <laughs> the sobering moments of the last decade of social media is that uh, depending upon whose hands these technologies fall into, we can have great and amazing outcomes or really, really destructive ones. And so for me, I'm very uh, animated by and excited about and even hopeful for. Um, the next iteration or version, you know, whatever it's going to be, Web 4.0 or something uh, related to a public interest Internet. I think infrastructure is going to be key here. I think we're going to have to, um, uh, you know, figure out how to build the airport <laughs> right now. I, the social media companies are flying planes around with nowhere to land. And so I'm really uh, excited about the potential for revolutionary infrastructure that serves uh, the people for the broadest possible good. And that, um, of course, includes um, serving folks that generally have had a very uh, difficult time being represented by our major institutions. I think that one is, that's one of the greatest uh, gifts of a truly global technology that allows for so much uh, content to be produced and circulated. But at the same time, uh, we can't allow that to be consolidated into the hands of very few people uh, or very powerful people. 
Thank you. Uh, and Reverend Brooks. Sure. Well, I'll just uh, begin by uh, maybe making this uh, benedictory note, which is, you know, I've long believed that hope is not something which can be empirically demonstrated, it has to be morally chosen. And so what gives me hope in this moment is that we have a generation of students and activists and advocates who are developing their own hermeneutic of history, right? So in other words, we're celebrating tonight an archive, but it's not merely the collection of video testimonies and, and witnesses. We see this as, as a, a chorus of voices to help us understand our times. And so when we have 13 and 14 year olds who understand the punishment exception to the 13th Amendment, when we have 19 year olds who understand the connection between modern day policing and lynching, we have some hope that people can appreciate the lessons of the Holocaust in this 2021 moment. That this hermeneutic of history, of understanding history in a ways that expands our sense of agency, our sense of resilience, our sense of our ability to address hate in our time, that gives me hope, right? Uh, you know, in other words, 27 million people taking to the streets, talking about George Floyd and Emmett Till. That's, that's a powerful notion of history and a, a powerful uh, movement in, in the making. That gives me hope. Um, let me thank you all again for the insights that you've shared and, and to USC Shoah Foundation, to uh, CC, to all of the, the work and faith and scholarship and commitment that went into making uh, this archive possible, making it available to an ever larger community to let us harvest the lessons and take them forward in our own lives. We thought it would be fitting to let the witnesses have the final word. So uh, if you'll please stay with us for a few more minutes to watch uh, USC Shoah Foundation testimony clips from their Holocaust, Guatemala and Rwanda collections, as well as from President Bacow and that uh, 101 year old Harvard Law graduate, um, Ben Francis interviews. I think uh, it's interesting to hear what they have to say, both about the value of testimony and their messages for the future. One of the lessons that we take from this is that we all have a responsibility um, for, for others, that we can't simply say, well, this is not happening here, that we need to speak out in response to injustice. Um, uh, as Dr. King said, uh, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. I think it's very important that this is happening, that these kinds of interviews are going on um, for a number of reasons, not just the obvious one, that there's still people around who try to deny that these events took place, and of course they did, and it's important to have real witnesses who can tell you about them and, and uh, have them studied later on. It's also important for those of us that you're interviewing. I find it very healing and very useful, difficult, poignant. I feel up, I, my emotions are uh, mobilized, but it's, I'm very glad of it. I'm grateful for that. Decirle a la juventud que son como como los protagonistas para el nuevo destino de 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 nuestros países el nuevo destino para las buenas relaciones armoniosas que es tan importante el respeto es tan importante el valorar la vida es tan importante prepararse eh, mental moral espiritual eh, académicamente y es muy importante también el servicio o sea, eh, si la juventud puede entender que el servicio es porque uno tiene oportunidad de aprender y en ese aprendizaje oportunidad de compartir con los que lo necesitan. The new generation are the ones who are going to um, make sure that um, we, we are not going to 
have this thing happening again anymore. So, and I think um, my message to them is to tell them that they should um, honor the memories of their their people, like our, all of us, the stories of what happened, making sure that um, it, it stays and people are learning and they are learning, they are teaching their to teaching them to their kids and making sure this is not forgotten. Instead of going to war, which would inevitably kill large numbers of innocent people, you turn to the rule of law to settle whatever differences there may be between nations. And uh, if there is no court, uh, you have no choice but to turn to force, armed force. If you turn to armed force and continue to turn to armed force, I'm telling you, as a man who's been around here for a hundred years, you'll kill everybody on this planet. And I'm talking to young people. Don't let it happen. Uh, there are billions of planets in space where they cannot find a trace of life. Shall planet Earth become one of them?